Alan Hirsch Advisors, creating aha moments, presents Aha Business Podcasts. We provide opportunities to discover information to help you run your business and guide your decision making. The more you know, the better decisions you make. For more information, log on to alanhirschadvisors.com. I'm your host, Alan Hirsch. Welcome to today's podcast. My guest is David Sherry, President and CEO of General Business Strategies. So welcome to the show, David. Nice to have you. Uh, It's good to be here. uh, So what motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Uh, Well, you know, I think the main main thing is the relationships that I have with my clients. Um, I'm a trusted advisor to them, and I just enjoy helping small businesses sell to the federal government. And so every client's unique. There's always a unique challenge that seems to take place. And I, I really get into like the problem solving of helping these clients out. Oh, that's great. So how'd you get started in this uh, uh, business of helping uh, uh, businesses deal with the federal government? Yeah, so my 30 plus years in, as a, in my career was in the federal government contracting arena. And so throughout my career, I was helping small businesses grow, merging up, being acquired, um, just navigating through the whole federal procurement process. And so I did that for 30 plus years. And then about since 2011, I decided to go out on my own. I just enjoyed working with smaller businesses that have unique challenges. Uh, They're usually very fast growing and they're energizing uh, versus a very large organization, which is a little bit more stoic. Um, So I really uh, just took that experience I had from the 30 years and I just bring it to my clients. And I've just enjoyed doing that since 2011. So what what are some of the areas that you work with uh, and tell us a little bit about the, ba- the uh, background and areas of expertise that you bring to the table. Okay. So I, my background experience in, is across all aspects of business management. So business operations, uh, business development, finance and administration. So when I work with my clients, I'm usually helping them out. Um, it seems like most of my efforts go into business development. And most of these small clients are looking to figure out how do they get government contracts? And so a lot of my time is spent in the business development arena, but quite often uh, my clients have internal issues. They have organizational de- development issues. They're growing rapidly. Their infrastructure may not be in place. So they may be asking about how do you set up an accounting system within my business if I'm a federal contractor? Uh, what type of compliance issues are there from an HR perspective? And how do I respond to these solicitations? How do I get in front of clients? So it's a broad range of uh, just advise, advisory services that I provide to these clients that are new to the government contracting space, or they've been, at, been in it for a while and they're rapidly growing, but their systems just aren't mature enough to, uh, to serve the growth that they're experiencing. So again, so what, what kind of industries are you working with? Uh, what do your clients look like? So most of my clients are in the professional services arena. So typically it would be a government IT contractor. It may be a science uh, contractor. A lot of my clients uh, actually place people on government site. Um, Some of them are in the cyber space and the classified space. Um, So I across health, health, health is another area. Um, Health IT is big in the government, Um, you know, HHS, health and human services and CMS are big clients that, that that my clients serve. And so I, I tend to work across um, all of the federal agencies and primarily with small businesses that are delivering services, professional services uh, in either the engineering, IT, or the sciences. So and by the way, typically my, my typical uh, client size is somewhere between, you know, past the startup phase, usually two or $3 million of annual revenue up to $100 million of annual revenue. Yeah, so, you know, can you describe uh, why and how government contracting differs from commercial contracting? Yeah, I think the biggest difference is the sales cycle. Um, you know, we could be—I could be a commercial contractor and and have a, a contact a lead, and within a week or two, I could have an order for services or products. Uh, the government contracting arena doesn't work that way. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's somewhat bureaucratic. Uh, it's very lengthy. The sales cycle is, can be. Typically, minimally, it's six months. Uh, typically, it could be years. So large service procurements, uh, essentially, you'd have to track them ahead of time, seeing when they're coming out. The government issues a request for solicitation or a request for proposal. Uh, it takes you know, a month or two to even respond to that, a very complex document. 
And then the government goes into an evaluation period. Often it, it, it can be six months to a year before they make a decision for a larger procurement. Um, the government also uses ordering vehicles. There's something called GSA, General Services Administration, has an ordering vehicle that they buy a lot of services off of. So they've attempted to streamline the procurement process, but it's still so much longer than it is in the commercial, commercial marketplace. So do you work with clients in trying to help them, and I forget the name of it, but it's uh, uh, federal contracting. I think there are 11 departments of the federal government that will uh, try to work with unique, uh, exceptionally st strange and unique programs that they're offering, and they'll actually fund it. Do you work with your clients on some of those? So I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. I know there, the government does have, uh, particularly for small businesses, they have a preferential treatment program. That's, and, and the Small Business Administration has a program called the 8A. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. No, I'm not referring to it, but you can okay. describe the 8A okay. for us. So the 8A is a, a program designed by the Small Business Administration to provide a, a preferential treatment to socially and economically disadvantaged small businesses. So minority-owned businesses, hub-zone, veteran-owned businesses, um, American Indian, uh, Native American businesses. And those programs are designed to limit competition to help these small businesses uh, you know, get government contracts. And so you can literally be awarded a sole source contract without competition up to $4 million. So it's a very, um, it's a very active program uh, to support small businesses um, but it's also a, a very challenging program to navigate. So you may be eligible to become an 8A contractor, but uh, that's just the first step. You still need to go out and find a client that's willing to fund you uh, for that type of a work. And very similar to, very similar to the commercial marketplace, um, relationships are key in the government contracting arena. You, know, you, you just don't get a contract, you know, you th throw a proposal over the fence and hope a contract comes back. You really need to position yourself and build the relationships with the government buying authorities. There's contracting officers and there's program offices that are out there uh, that you need to somehow build a relationship with uh, so you get the visibility. So when, in fact, you submit your proposal, it has a high probability of being awarded. Yeah. So one of the challenges I understand from 8A is 8A is a, is a plan to get businesses to grow, but eventually they need to support commercial ventures. Yeah. So, so yeah, how, do you, how do you work with 8As to get them into the commercial space as well as the government space? So the answer is the, the 8A is a limited time frame. It's typically nine years um, as an 8A a contractor, and then you graduate from that program. And so the key is to map out a strategy to help that small 8A contractor transition into the full and open competition space. And sometimes that's by partnering uh, with larger businesses, building relationships with, part with partner relationships. Uh, so when you do graduate, um, you either are graduating from an 8A contract to just a small business contract uh, qualification, and then eventually graduating from a small business into a large business. And the government's got something called NACE codes, which designates what the uh, size determination is. So if you're in the, in the IT arena, typically, you know, once you cross the 25 or $30 million threshold, you're, you're no longer considered a small business. Or if you have over 500 employees is the other a threshold that they typically use, depending upon the NACE code that they're, that they're selecting. Yeah. So it's very important. I mean, strategic planning, is, I know you do some of that, Alan. Is yes, I do. Very important. And I've, and I've worked with some 8As, but to uh, explain it, I think is very important to uh, those in the federal space that want to be in the federal space that are smaller businesses and what they need to do. Yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. There's so many contracts that I run into that have never really sat back strategically. They're just responding to contracts and solicitations and sometimes they're very successful at it. And then all of a sudden they find themselves uh, you know, running out of running room in terms of competing. And so they haven't really taken the time to set up a really good strategic plan that, that positions them for a good transition to full and open competition. Yeah, it's, it's, uh... Uh, over and over again, uh, we, we try to uh, take what they're doing and learning in the federal space mm -hmm. and get them in the commercial space. Because that's the, that's the reason 
the Small Business Administration established the 8A in order to get businesses into the commercial space. Yeah, they, well, they want to make sure they're self-sufficient beyond that right. program. Uh, you, right. can, you can just stay in the, the government space and just be a large government contractor. I mean, look at Lockheed Martin and, and other ones that are out there. Well, I don't but, think they started as 8As, but anyway. I uh, may not. I <laughs> probably acquired a bunch of them at some point in time. Yeah. But I, I will uh, say there is one other program that maybe you were alluding to this. There's something called the Small Business Innovation Research Program. I think that is it that I yeah, heard so about. The, the government congressionally mandated to spend about two billion dollars supporting small business research and it's a really for companies that are into technology and innovation it's a wonderful program uh, you essentially you submit an application for a phase one which you can get up to $150,000 to fund your your concept it's a proof of concept and there's right. very little accountability they pretty much you, you you submit the proposal saying hey I want to develop this concept and if you develop and after the six months or a year you develop that concept you submit a phase two proposal which can give you $750,000, a million dollars to develop your product, um, which you own. You, you own all the intellectual property that you're developing. The government's funding it for you. But then the burden on you, and maybe this is what you're referring to, is you have a responsibility to commercialize that product and take it to the commercial marketplace. So this is an incubator program that the government um, has. Asked <laughs> Excuse me. Sure, bless you. To have small businesses uh, you know, develop their concepts and, and products and bring them into the commercial marketplace. Well, the, the phase three is, uh, from what I understand, they'll take a uh, product if they like it, and they're required, required to buy uh, millions of dollars worth of product from the company they've invested in. So the phase three is the commercialization phase, and in some circumstances, particularly in DOD, uh, when they're developing technologies, those technologies are being developed for defense purposes. So the government becomes the commercial buyer. <laughs> right, in right. In many right. other circumstances, particularly uh, NIH is very big in, in developing uh, health inter innovations. And so typically when you get through a phase two and you go to phase three, typically you're selling to the commercial marketplace and not back to the government. Yeah. So let's get back on to the subject of dealing with the federal contractors. So what are some of the biggest challenges you see your clients facing? I think the biggest challenge is business development. Uh, it's a highly competitive marketplace and understanding uh, the process of how you navigate through identifying opportunities, making sure you're qualified for the opportunity, um, teaming with the right partners, writing a really good proposal and pricing it appropriately. Um, really understanding what are the evaluation criteria that the government's using to select the contractor. So I think the business development is one of the main areas. The other area is compliance with all of the bureaucracy. When you get a government contract, it's not a three page <laughs> document. It's typically, yes, you know, hundreds of pages in some circumstances, depending upon the com complexity of the, of the contract. But there's, there's something called the federal acquisition regulations, which governs all of this. And uh, there are pages and pages and pages of referenced uh, federal regulations that you must comply with. And for most of people that are new into the government contracting space, it's, it's like really difficult for them to understand. For people that are experienced in it, um, it's, it's not as complicated as you think it is. It's pretty much common sense stuff um, with the exception of some key provisions, which you are legally required to comply with. So it's, it's a bit more bureaucratic to do work for the federal government. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, do they ever run into this, uh, uh, what is it, the, uh, uh, self-evaluation requirements of the federal yeah. government? Yeah, there is. There's something, um, the CPARS program, the Contract and Performance Assessment Reporting System. It's essentially, it's a grading. It's, it's a report card on how well you perform. And you bring up a really good point, Alan, because it's one thing to win the contract, but once you win it, you have to perform. Right. And if you fail to perform, the government has got a grading system. <laughs> uh, you kind of get on record that you kind of got a D or an F on that opportunity. It's actually a five-point grading system. And, uh, when you submit a new proposal or a follow-on proposal for more work, the government looks at that system and they say, well, how well has this contractor performed in the past? And because uh, they will not award a contract to a contractor that uh, did not perform. Yeah, so one of the things they, they look at with the federal government, I would I think, is uh, self-evaluation, a company that does the self-evaluation, how it uh, reports on the strategic plans to make sure that they're complying with all of the requirements the federal government issues. 
Yeah, there's a variety of compliance requirements where self-reporting is required. By the way, if you're a federal contractor and you're receiving federal funds and you have more than 50 employees, I mean, one of the biggest things that, from a compliance perspective is an affirmative action plan. So unlike you know, a commercial contractor that may have hundreds of employees, um, you have to have an affirmative action plan that demonstrates that you're hiring equitably and that you're complying with the federal laws. So it's very complicated. We're going to take a break right now uh, and go to a commercial break. I've got a couple commercial sponsors. Uh, and when we come back from the break, I'll continue our conversation with their, David Sherry, President and CEO of General Business Strategies. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, and this is AHA Business Podcast. Hi, Rick Dempsey here. As a former Oriole and Series MVP, I know a lot about winning and championship teams. Today, I'm happy to tell you about my award-winning web design and internet marketing team, Adventure Web Interactive. For over two decades, many of Maryland's most successful firms have chosen Adventure Web as their strategic partner for web design and online marketing. I can tell you from using them personally, their search engine optimization and social media programs have saved their clients tens of thousands over the traditional pay-per-click digital agency. Visit AdventureWebInteractive.com and listen to what clients such as Hercules Fence, TriStar Electric, ABC Rental, Rhine Landscaping, Markdown's Office Furniture, and many more highly successful firms have to say. And don't forget to tell them Rick Dempsey sent you. Strengthen, protect, and preserve your retirement nest egg. Scott Garceau here for the Stephen J. Sless Group, Baltimore's reverse mortgage specialist. Reverse mortgages have evolved to become a viable retirement tool. Enjoy retirement without monthly mortgage payments, improve cash flow, pay off debt, and stretch retirement savings. Stephen and his team can offer strategies to make housing wealth work for you. If you're 62 or older, learn if a reverse mortgage could help. Visit ReverseBaltimore.com. An equal housing opportunity lender. This is not a commitment to last Stephen J. Sless, NMLS 298581, or in my NMLS 3094. Welcome back to the show. Uh, my guest is David Sherry, President and CEO of General Business Strategies. Thank you for being here, David. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so can you give a, a sense of the government contracting lifestyle? I mean, uh, uh, life cycle, excuse me, not lifestyle, life cycle. Uh, a start to finish analysis because uh, I think people that want to get into the government contracting don't really understand it. Yeah, sure. So I, I talked a little bit about the business development cycle, which is really where everything starts, uh, the front end of the business, as we often call it. And that really is um, doing your, first off, if you want to get in the business, you really need to register your business. You have to get a DUNS number. You have to go on the government system. There's a system called SAM.gov where you register to do business with the federal government. So there's a little bit of an upfront bureaucratic process that you start with. Once you've done that, um, you really have to go out and determine what products and services you're selling and identify the agencies that are buying those types of products and services. And that takes some market research. There's a lot of public databases that are out there. There's some industry days you can go to with the various different agencies that are out there. But once you've identified the agency that you're interested in pursuing or the agencies, then it's a matter of looking at their procurement plan to see what type, when they're buying these services and through what mechanisms, what contract mechanisms are they using. And so that whole process of positioning yourself and doing the research is critically important. And then there is the proposal. You have to write a really good proposal that is 100% compliant with the request for proposal or the, or the government solicitation. I've seen contractors spend hundreds of hours preparing proposals and submitting it and only to have it rejected because it didn't comply with a very specific requirement. Um, something was incomplete, or they filled something out incorrectly, et cetera. So that upfront process of uh, capturing business uh, is the beginning of the life cycle. Now, once the contract, if you're fortunate enough to be successful and you're awarded a contract, then you have to perform as you and I were discussing earlier. And the whole process of the contract execution is, is there's something called the, the, the PMI, is something called PMBOK. It, essentially, it's a process of project management where you kick off the project. Typically, you're going to meet with the client um, and have a kickoff process, make sure everyone's clear on what the contractual requirements are. And then you have to develop a work plan. Then you have to execute that work plan. 
There's going to be specific deliverables, milestones. You, you may be graded to have to do a self-evaluation in terms of how well you performed against those milestones and those key metrics. And then once you've completed the contract, which, oh, by the way, for services, typically they can be five-year contracts. That's something else that's very different between the commercial marketplace and the government marketplace is that these service contracts typically are five-year contracts. And, and, so and one of the things those contracts provide, it increases value of a business if you ever want to sell it. Absolutely. Because so, they're not, you're not requiring one contract that's, that, uh, uh, that lasts a short period of time. These long contracts add tremendous value to the value of a business. So when value you and, and, and cash flow, which is something that acquirers are very interested it's, it's in. A, yeah, they have the cash have flow, they have the value, uh, and they, it, it can increase the asset of the, uh, of the owners. I think that's, it's very common for small businesses. Once they get up to the, you say a hundred million dollar mark or 50 to hundred million dollar mark uh, to be acquired um, because there is this no man's land. When you become a small business and you, you, and you graduate, maybe you're doing $150 million worth of business, which is a really nice size business, but <laughs> you're competing against billion dollar companies, companies. Lock, North of Grumman, Lockheed Martin, et cetera. And it's very hard to compete in that space. So it's very common for an exit from a merger and acquisition perspective for companies to exit being acquired by larger companies. Yes, and it, and it uh, uh, but these kinds of contracts add value, even if you were in a commercial space, they add value, uh, a managed services agreement with a uh, uh, IT sol uh, solutions provider is more valuable than an hourly rate. Absolutely, absolutely, there's no doubt it, about it. It increased value. So that's one thing that you look at when you get into the government space. That's very true. So, you know, what's a, what are some of the, well, that's one of the advantages of doing business with the federal government. What are some of the other advantages so, of working with the federal government? Good question. The biggest advantage, the federal government is probably the best payer that's out there. Um, you know, if you have a government contract, you get paid on a monthly basis without exception. Possibly, you know, if the government shuts down for a couple of months and their payment offices are closed, you know, and our Congress can't make a decision, um, that might happen. But they really are um, the best payer that's out there. And interestingly enough, the banks really like that. So if you want to borrow money uh, <laughs> to grow your business, um, they see that you've got a strong backlog of government contracts. So they know you're going to get paid and they know the cash is going to come in. So they're, you're less of a risk than perhaps a startup commercial business doesn't really have the cash flow that's out there. Um, that's a huge advantage um, uh, versus in the commercial industry. Um, yeah, go ahead. And as I mentioned, the, you know, the, the, although the sales cycle is much longer, the term of these contracts tend to be very long. And as you mentioned, they increases value to the business, um, to the owners, as well as potentially for selling it. Yeah, so what are, what are some of the advice you have for someone who is thinking about pursuing government contracts for the first time? Yeah, I think you need to do your homework and make sure you're prepared. Um, if you're accustomed to being in the commercial marketplace and having transactions happen pretty rapidly and uh, without a lot of bureaucracy, um, I, I think you need to go in it with your eyes open. Um, I think you need to get advice from people that understand the space uh, to make sure that not only- Someone like you. Someone like me, <laughs> um, as well as um, to make sure you're compliant. I mean, so- and there are a tremendous amount of uh, uh, regulations that are associated with these contracts. Some are worse than others, but for the most part, if you run a if you run a disciplined business, you're going to be okay. You just need to know what you don't know, and um, that's what I'm there to help a lot of my clients yeah. in that regard. Well, so many, and that's why I do this podcast. It because you don't the business owners don't know what they don't know, and being able to help them, uh, you know the to provide answers and knowledge uh, because the more you know, the better decisions you can make. Mm -hmm. So what's the largest value uh, or, or how important is it to partner with the government uh, in contracting? Yes, yeah, so it's very important to partner with other industry partners as you pursue government work, um, especially if you're a small business because the larger businesses tend to have deep relationships within many of the federal agencies. And uh, one way to connect 
to those agencies is through a lar- partnering with a larger business. By the way, the larger businesses typically, for the large full and open contract awards, typically those large businesses have something called a small business subcontracting plan. Right. Has specific goals where they are obligated contractually to subcontract to small businesses. Um, so the, what the small business brings to the table, in addition to whatever technical competencies they bring, they bring that small business status, which allows the prime contractor, the large contractor to comply with the contract terms. So partnering is critically important. Um, it's very often that these large contractors, they, they want to go after work in an agency, but the work is set aside for small businesses. So they will come to you as a small business. If you've got a good past performance reputation and you've got good capabilities and they'll say, Hey, XYZ company, we'd like to be your teaming partner on this opportunity that we've identified. It's set aside for small business. We'd like you to be the small business and we would like to be your subcontractor. So quite often it flips where the, the prime, these large prime contractors can be your subcontractor. Well, it's all, it also flips where the uh, prime contractor can be the prime and the small business can be the subcontractor. Yeah, that's very common. And in and, and those circumstances, like I said, the prime contractor typically has subcontracting goals where they have to award some right. contracts to small businesses. Right. Now, I, I know some situations where some of my clients uh, uh, helped out in many cases, uh, large contracts by being those con- subcontractors. Yeah. And I'll mention one of the areas I help my clients um, is negotiating those agreements with the large businesses. You know, the small guys tend to be taken advantage from time to time because they just don't know any better. And they're so anxious and hungry to get the work, they'll, they'll sign anything. Yeah. And so one of the value I bring to the table is making sure that the terms of those subcontracts that they're signing are favorable for the small business and doesn't jeopardize them. So what's the greatest value? I mean, one of the, what's, what's the value you bring and services you provide to your clients? Uh, that many people don't understand? Well, because my background is broad um, across business development operations, finance and administration, I bring a strategic viewpoint in terms of how those, all those pieces come together. So I can advise, advise across the spectrum in that regard. So I really end up building a trusted advisor relationship with most of my clients. Um, they can call me for anything. Um, what they don't know about me is that I've got merger and acquisition experience. So if in fact they are thinking about exiting their business and selling it somewhere down the road or potentially acquiring a smaller business to help them increase their capabilities, I have a lot of experience, uh, in that area as well. Um, I also have a strong human resource management background experience. So in addition to helping them deal with their talent acquisition, um, organizational development issues, it's, it's very common as businesses grow rapidly. The businesses grow around the people that started the business. And that's often a big challenge for a business owner because he or she may have someone that's been with them for 10 years and help them build the business, but they don't have what the business needs from a skill and experience perspective. So I help them navigate that in a very humanistic way to try and position that person for success, but also advising the client to bring in some new talent if, if they want to go to the next level. Well, you're, you're also trying, if their talent they have uh, is it not on the right seat in the bus. They're not doing, you know, you're trying to help them, I would assume in HR, trying to get the right people in the right bu- in the right seat in the bus sure. so that and, they can help, they can help better by being in a different position than they've been in for 10 years and uh, benefit the company far greater. And you, you know, and the goal is to make everyone successful and make the business successful. One of the, Biggest areas that I find when I go into smaller businesses is they don't have um, any form of performance management system in place. So sometimes you go in and you ask someone, you chat with them and you go into a little coaching and say, well, what do you do? What's your job? And they might say, I'm not sure, you know, because there's <laughs> not a, there's not a good job description. There's not clarity between what there isn't a good that. job description. <laughs> can you believe that? <laughs> well, I, I can. Uh, uh, a lot of small businesses take shortcuts. And, uh, and one of the things they have to do with government compliance is make sure that they are, their systems are very much similar to what the large businesses are. Yeah. It, 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 first of all, it's good for the business. I mean, right. people are clear on their roles and responsibilities and, and there's a system in place to kind of give people feedback 
that's ideal situation. But not only is it good for the business, it, it's important to, just to have internal equity within organizations so people feel like they're being treated fairly and safely. Yeah. So is there anything we have forgotten to, that you do or work with your clients that would be helpful for the uh, small business executive that you would like as clients? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I deal with two different types of clients. One is one that's already in the federal government contracting arena um, that all of a sudden is growing. They start off pretty small. And so I help them through that growth, that cycle of growth and throughout whatever level of maturity their business is in. And then there are clients that are in the commercial space and they're thinking, you know, I've, I've heard about this federal government contracting arena. I want to kind of uh, balance my business a little bit, and maybe add that to my portfolio. I want to pursue it. And so I think I bring tremendous value to clients that uh, are looking to get into the federal space and really know very little about it. Um, typically, the reason why I deal with small businesses is because when a business becomes, you know, 100 or 150 million or $200 million business, typically they will have, I would advise them that you need to be hiring the types of people with my background and experience um, throughout the organization. You, you need that internally. You shouldn't be relying on a consultant. Right. To run the business. So. Well, so how do uh, business owners reach you? Sure. So my website is uh, www.genbiz, G-E-N-B-I-Z-1, the number one, dot com. Um, or you can look, just look up genbiz1.com or general business strategies and we'll be on the internet. You can contact me or you can email me directly at uh, dsherry at genbiz1.com. Well, David, thank you very much for participating in today's podcast. Uh, I look forward to uh, uh, other opportunities we have together. Yeah, it's uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, please join me next week when my guest will be Vito Mazda. He is a, a collection company that does it quite uniquely. Uh, it should be an interesting conversation. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, your host. To reach me, call 443-977-4500 or visit my website at www.alanhirschadvisors.com. You can listen to all podcasts and past shows wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Alan Hirsch, and this has been AHA Business Podcasts.